Okay, that's my little bit of talking, although I probably will never stop talking. But I'm going to start doing this wonderful dish, which is a chicken cooked in milk. How are you doing today, brother? You good? As I always try and involve everyone here, you know, it would be rude for me not to acknowledge this guy. So I have a normal chicken here, and I also have some sage, I have some lemon, I have some butter, I've got a whole lemon here, uh, and I have a fennel as well, which is for a different dish. And this is such an easy way to cook chicken. And I should point out, actually, the first time I did this recipe was actually using uh, a veal shoulder, but you could also use a pork shoulder as well. Uh, beef is okay to use, but I'll generally stick to pork or veal or chicken. And what I really love about this recipe is the simplicity of it. And it may sound a little bit weird at the moment, but because you're cooking in, in milk, once the milk actually hits temperature, it splits into curds and whey, and you end up with a beautiful richness through the chicken. And of course, because it's cooked in liquid, it's so moist as well. So you don't need to baste. You don't need to do anything. You follow the recipe, which I've written, which is available in the macro stand uh, opposite the celebrity theatre here, and, and, and you cook this recipe and you will love it. So without further ado, we get a pot going, if I can get the gas working here. A lovely Fisher and Pike will set up. And we want to get this pot to kind of a, a, you know, a medium hot temperature. You don't want to get it absolutely scalding hot because what will happen is you'll just burn the chicken straight away. So the first step we're going to do here is actually just give the chicken a nice colour because we all like to have our roast chickens or cooked chickens with a nice roasty kind of colour on top of there. So I'm just going to go in and give a nice amount of pepper on top there. Silence as I put the pepper on. Okay. Now... Oh, a little bit of salt, but I don't want to go too much on the salt at this stage. We can do that a little bit later if we need to. I'm going to get a little bit of butter and start to melt that in here. Do you want to come over here, my friend? Come close to me. It's very lonely up on stage all by myself. Don't feel sorry for me, it's fine. <laughs> okay, now, I'm just going to turn that, get a nice amount of heat. And then we're basically going to seal this off. You guys can hear that? I just want to grab a tea towel if I can see one. Here we go. Just stay there, brother. You guys have got the best seats in the house. You're going to really smell this coming across pretty soon. What are your names over here? Lena, Lena lovely to meet you. Chicken hands. <laughs> Nikki. Trish, I'm going to come around here so I don't have to do the rude reach, guys. And Melissa, lovely to meet you all. Okay, so over here, we just want to get a nice browning colour on here. And theoretically, uh, this is quite an interesting step because you don't really need to do it. It will cook in milk regardless of whether we seal this or not. But one of the reasons we're sealing it now is to get that nice bronze colour we all associate with cooked meats. Yeah, so this is more, almost more of a psychological thing. She got it right. You said it. Okay, so just, that's got a little bit longer. And then what I'm going to do over here is get the lemon. And I've just got a potato peeler. This is a speed peeler we use in kitchens. Very cheap and a fantastic peeler. I'm just going to take some nice strips off there and I'm not pushing down too hard because I don't want to actually kind of um, start taking the pith off there. Once the pith gets into there it might make the end result here go a little bit bitter and we don't want that at all. I've also got some garlic. Let's put that to the side for a moment. And two cloves of garlic will be great. We don't want too much. Oh these are very colourful and got finesse haven't they? Great. And just crush them with a knife. I don't need to worry about chopping that really finely because it's purely in there for flavour and we're not really going to be eating it at all. So this should be browning quite nicely now, Mr. Chicken. Okay. Are you in the pan? Can you see that? Say, mmm, if you think it looks good. Say, mmm, if you're in love. God, God. There's only half of you. Okay. So at this stage, I'm going to rip this guy out. and let him rest there for a moment. I'm going to go in with the lemon zest straight into this pot. And then we'll get the garlic in as well, and I've got some nice sage here. And I'm not going to worry about picking that too much, I'm going to go in with that as well. And we'll give it a little bit of a stir around. We don't really want to cook this out too much at this stage, I'm stirring it purely just to combine all those ingredients together. And I'm going to go back in with the chicken. And then I've got some full cream milk. Do not sort of think with this recipe, oh, I'm going to sort of make it a little bit of a, uh, a healthy number and put something like Rev or something like that in there. They're fantastic and low cholesterol and fat. But what will happen is a lot of those milks are actually made with water and milk solids. So they will not really do the job of normal milk. So we put that into there. And you want it almost to cover. Is everyone following so far? Easy. Hands in the air. Who would do this at home so far? 
You haven't even tasted it, it's a pretty good outcome. So I'm going to put the lid on. I'm going to pop that into the oven about 40 minutes or so. Where is my oven? There it is. Well, I might just, I don't know if I've got room because I've got a bit of a here's one we've done earlier in there. So what I might do is just let that kind of simmer away just for a second there because what I want to make is a little bit of an accompaniment to go with that. Now, I came across a little something which is by no means a new ingredient called quinoa. And I went around for the first six months saying, I'm going to make a quinoa salad. And I was, um, I was corrected that it's quinoa. But then I was corrected once again by Jen saying it can also be pronounced quinoa. And quinoa is a lovely, uh, like a grain. And it's a little bit like couscous. Can you see that? Who uses this at home? It's so healthy for you. It's in the macro brand. And we use it a lot at home now because of its ease of preparation, I guess. And basically all we do with that is we take a little pot, and this goes beautifully with the chicken dish I'm making. What we want to do is toast that a little bit like we would a risotto. Who makes risotto at home? Oh, I make, you know, I make, I make it every day, all the time. <laughs> Okie dokie. So I've got that on kind of a medium to high heat, and we want to toast that for about five minutes, and then exactly like we do with uh, couscous, we're basically going to put some water into there, bring it up to the boil, that will cook for 15 minutes, and then we take it off, and let it sit, and then it will steam right up and absorb all that liquid in there. And I've got a here's one we've done earlier, but I kind of want to go through this process just a little bit. Is everyone from Sydney here? Anyone from Melbourne? <sighs> Originally. Oh, great. Do you know, I went, I, whenever I'm in Sydney, because um, when I'm in Melbourne, I don't really get nights off too much. So I don't get to eat out much. I think I eat out in Sydney more than I do in Melbourne. I seem to come up here every week or every second week for one reason or another. And there's some fabulous restaurants up here, which I really enjoy. Uh, I went to Pilu at Freshwater. Who's been there? What a restaurant. Quite a few people. Really my kind of food. Southern Italian, kind of Sardinian cooking, isn't it? Did you say you've been there? Just nod. Just go with the flow, you know. That's fine. Okay, so I've got that on. As I said before, we bring it up to the boil, reduce it to a simmer, and cook it out for 15 minutes, take it off and then leave it sit for a further five or so minutes until it really swells up, at which stage you have this. And so this is a lot like couscous, yeah? And you've got to remember as well, it's sort of really swelling up. It, it literally triples in size. Now, what I want to do is make a nice kind of almost summery salad to go with this. Uh, and I know they sort of tend to put a whole lot of Middle eastern flavours and stuff like that into here. I mean, you can take it in any direction you want, really. But because I cook Italian food, I'm going to take it in an Italian kind of direction clean as we go. So I have some capers. What I want to do is just really roughly chop those. I mean, you don't have to. I always like using the kind of finer capers, or they call them lily put capers as well. Some of the big capers which you get, you know the ones about that big? There's nothing wrong with them. But what happens is they pop them in a brine so they can be stored on the shelf, and they often absorb a lot of that moisture. And to me, I taste mo mainly vinegar when I eat them. Anyone agree? OK. Yes. So. <laughs> So I always go for the little ones. They're not going to absorb as much moisture into there, and I think they've got a much pump, uh, kind of punchier flavour. So where's a big mixing bowl that I can use? Here we go. This will do. I'll just do a smaller amount. Have you got a big... Uh, where is he? Have you guys got a big glass mixing bowl out back I can have? You watch. One will appear any moment magically. There we go. Isn't that fantastic, everyone? <laughs> Don't you wish you had one of these at home? Thank you so much. They're incredible. Okay, life is much easier with this. So I've got capers into there. Who uses fennel at home? I use fennel so much, and I think fennel, my wife hates it, and I think it's either one of those things you love or you hate because it's like licorice. It has an aniseed flavour, and people are either into it or they're not at all. So what we've got here is some fennel, and you can do one of two things. Uh, it's much like an onion. Are you focusing uh, close on here, brother? So you want to take the core out of it, and then you can basically go through and slice it like that. Or if you want to do it a little bit of an easier way, you can take a peeler and literally just take shreds. And the nice thing of doing this is you get really beautiful fine slices. In kitchens, we have a thing called a mandolin. Everyone knows what that is. It's basically, um, or they call, I call it a death stick sometimes. It's like a piece of wood with a, a sticking up blade. And chefs are notorious. You literally run it across there and take slices. And notorious for taking off a bit of finger or even a nice bit of a heel of your palm. I think I heard a few people go, ooh, ah, <laughs> just then. Okay, so I'm just going to take a little bit of that. Straight in. 
And these, you know, I mean, this is very appropriate for Sydney weather right now, I think. It's quite nice outside. I, was, I think I was the only guy in Sydney walking around in a t-shirt yesterday afternoon. People looking at me strangely. I came to Sydney, everyone's wearing like scarves and beanies and compared to Melbourne weather, I, I went to the market the other morning at 4.30 and it was like three degrees down there. Yeah, that's cold, huh? It's been snowing in the outer suburbs there as well. So I'm gonna take some of that into there. And then these guys here often get thrown away. I was in um, California last year and we were doing a pilot for a little show and we were going along and I saw some um, fennel prongs like this growing about this high and I got so excited. This is in the middle of Venice Beach, you know, and jumped out and started grabbing them because these tips on here have a bit of a taste of that. They're so, so beautiful. And I always keep these, do you like it? Or are you just saying that? Just say you like it either way. There's a lot of, a lot of faces looking at you right now, you know? <laughs> so these go beautifully in here. So I'm just gonna rip those off and pop them directly into there. And then I'm, I'm a strong believer in um, trying to use, you know, everything I can really. So with these, I would actually keep these. And in my kitchen we have, at the Kitchen Cat in Melbourne, we have a huge French rotisserie about this high and we roast things like whole salmon and whole fish on there. So I would keep these and put them in the center of that fish with like lemon or preserved lemon or something like that uh, and other aromatics. Uh, thyme is fantastic with that as well. And then these give off a beautiful flavor as well. Alternatively, if you want to do it at home, you would grab these and you just put them on the base of a tray and put a nice kind of snapper or something like that on top of there. Salt, pepper, olive oil, nice squeeze of lemon, and these will give off a lot of flavor as well. And also what that'll do by putting it down, it'll allow the air to go through under the fish too, so you don't end up with kind of a cooked fish on one side with a brownie color and, and a different color and a different kind of um, cookedness on the other, I would say. So get these guys into there. Stay tuned, guys. I'm going to be giving away free stuff in a minute. Don't go to sleep just yet. Who's been drinking wine already? Yeah. <laughs> In the Perth show, I asked that question a couple of years ago, and my God, there was so much noise. <laughs> it was unbelievable. It was fantastic. What a crowd to cook for. Okay, as well into here, I want to get some fresh mint. And with all the cooking I do, we use fresh ingredients. Never, if you're doing one of my recipes, try and substitute fresh for dried. They just don't have the same flavor. So I want to get some of this mint. Vietnamese mint could be nice in this as well. Just a little bit. And you can chop this, but I often like just to get in there. I know it's a little bit Jamie Oliver, but just get in there and rip it up with your fingers. This is just, you know, it's simple cooking, but very, very flavorsome. Okay. We'll get that into there. I might even get a little bit of parsley. I always think with herbs, you've got to be a little bit careful because if you start putting too much of something, flavors start to collide. And a lot of restaurants I go to these days, who dines out quite a bit? And you know micro cresses they put on things, those little baby cresses. They are a baby herb and they have flavor. And sometimes I think some chefs forget that and they do look very beautiful. And I've been to restaurants where there's like a fistful of that on top of something. And then you start to eat this beautiful meal they've cooked, but the amount of different colored and flavored and varieties micro cresses actually ends up making the whole dish to me taste like soap because you get all these flavors colliding. So you've got to be slightly careful of that. So I'm putting a little bit of flat leaf parsley. We've got the mint in there already. And then I'm just gonna get a bit of lemon zest. And for me, you know, I live in Melbourne and it's cold right now, but I think about sitting outside, maybe somewhere in Sydney by the pool and it's a beautiful day and kids running around under the sprinkler or whatever goes on and you have this kind of stuff and it's just really beautiful. Okay, now, cold pressed olive oil. Everyone know what cold-pressed olive oil is? Who doesn't? Who wants to know the difference between normal olive oil and cold-pressed olive oil? Okay, great. There's another little side lesson we do here. I always go on these tangents, you know. I end up getting someone out the back giving me the stick saying, stick to the, stick to the recipe, stick to the show. So this is a cold-pressed olive oil. Then we have an olive oil, uh, and this is what we call cold-pressed extra virgin olive oil. So what happens is olives come off the tree. I've been um, many, many times and seen this done. And what they'll often do is heat the olive because when they heat the olive, they can extract more olive oil from the olive. At the same time, when you start to heat that olive oil, once it goes above sort of 38, uh, 40 degrees, you start to actually lose a lot of the beautiful flavor or the original flavor from the olive. So by extracting cold press, which is as it sounds, they put the olives into the press and literally clamp them down and they get the, the 
the absolute kind of raw olive oil out of there, you get all the flavors also that are surrounding the olive tree. So they'll all have different flavors from grassy to peppery um, and sometimes fruity as well, which is fantastic. I had the pleasure a couple of years ago, I decided I'd been, you know, working flat out with 15 and books and all kinds of stuff. And I decided I'd put out so many recipes and stuff like that, that I just wanted to take some time out for myself and get back to the basics and go back. I was, I was actually pushed into this by my wife. I think she wanted to get rid of me for a while, but she said, go to Italy and do some stages. And stages are where you go into kitchens and you, you stand there for free and basically watch. And sometimes even in the better restaurants, you pay for the privilege. Uh, and I got the chance to go to a fantastic place in, uh, called Luca. Has anyone heard of that before? And I met um, a woman, and she was a few years younger, I'd probably be married to her. She was about 75, she's a baroness, uh, an, an amazing woman. She lived on her family's original estate, um, which was God knows how many square kilometers. It's got about 20 farmhouses on it, and then her villa itself is probably one of the most beautiful places in all of Italy. And back in the day, it was 100% self-sufficient. So they had their orchids, they had people producing grappa, cheese makers, they had uh, um, sheep there, these sheep that Matt Skinner and I thought were goats because we'd never seen a sheep that looked like this before. And they used their milk to make ricotta and, and different cheeses every single day, which was fantastic. Uh, and the Baroness actually gave the land back to the ancestors of the original people that ran those kind of um, productions to keep producing, to sell in the local markets, to keep that kind of tradition up, which is really, really wonderful. I forgot where I was going with that. So I'm on one of those tangents again. I'll come back to it, I'm very sure, soon. Well, ah, the olive oil. So, yes, thank you very much. First prize goes away. Who said that? Thank you so much. So the Baroness took me into this room. I sound like Grandpa Simpson sometimes, right? The, the Baroness took me into this beautiful old room, and I've got photos, I don't have it here, and they had this original um, olive oil press, and it isn't until you see one of these things you realise how simply uh, a lot of these ingredients were made. And it literally had like a stone trough and a huge bit of wood, like a beam that went up. And then it had this kind of, like a big winch thing that came down, and they literally had these kind of hessian bags which they would put the olives in, and they would kind of slot in under. And then they'd put this clamp all the way down and literally just press it and get the cold olive oil out. And she had her own olive oil, uh, which she gave me a bottle of. And I, I carried it all the way around Italy with me for probably the better part of six weeks and got back to Australia and they wouldn't let me bring it in, which was quite... Oh, you can imagine how upset I was. So, lemon zest, olive oil. We have a little bit of pepper. Capers have gone in, mint's gone in, parsley has gone in and fennel has gone in. And this is looking very, very nice. You could do other things into here. I mean, if you're into sun-dried tomatoes, they can go in. Olives can go in. You could put a different type of cheese in if you wanted to as well. Importantly, I want to have a little bit of a taste of this now to see how we are. I'm going to hit it with just a tiny bit of lemon juice. A little bit of lemon juice, not too much. And give that a mix. And let's get that on a plate. Have I got plates around somewhere, guys? Ah, let's get one of these. Okay. So, ladies and gents, that's my first finished dish. Quinoa salad with the capers and fennel. Thank you very much. I am putting together a meal here. This is where you clap if you want. Or don't. It's up to you. So I'm trying to put together a nice little spread here, really. Okay, now I need to make room because I'm about to start pulling a lot of food out. Um, that can go in there. Now let's have a look at this chicken. So, I've had a chicken that would have been cooking in the oven for about 40 minutes, about 180 degrees. And this is the here's one we've done earlier. I'm going to put that to the side here. And I've also got some vegetables, which are just very simply roasted vegetables baby carrots, pumpkin, sweet potato. Just to give you guys an idea of how easy you can pull a meal like this together. I mean, I reckon if, I was about to say if I was at home, let's say if my wife was at home, because I could probably do it a little bit quickly, I reckon she could pull this together. Well, I reckon I could do this whole, all of this in 40 minutes pretty easily, as long as the chicken took, um, would take to cook. So I reckon my wife could probably, you know, about an hour of preparation, she'd be there with this. So I'm just gonna take a little bit of parsley. 
We've got a division of labour in my house. I do all the cooking and, and the kitchen stuff. And um, she washes my chef jackets. Sometimes I think she could do one of those ads on TV, you know. It's just really, look at all this squid ink you've got in your jackets and stuff. Okay. So I get a little bit, I think mint's always nice with veggies as well. So I might get some of that into there. A little bit into there. Salt, pepper, some olive oil. I'll give this a little bit of a toss around. And if you're going to put herbs through things like roasted vegetables, they really do add so much flavour. Marjoram is beautiful through roasted vegetables, as is things like sage. But if you are going to do it for presentation and flavour, do it at the very end. Because I sort of... Dunk, so have, I, have I got that big plate here? Here we go. I might do it. I might do it this way around. Changing my mind here. So if you are going to do it, leave it to the very end. Because it does... Oh, God. Come over here, brother. Follow me. Get, get your camera in that pot there. So this is the here's one we've done earlier. And one thing I really love about this is if you don't eat all the chicken, it really carries beautifully over to the next day and you can start to shred it and have it in sandwiches like you would a normal roast chicken. But what we do in the restaurant is, can you see in there, we keep all that liquid. And when we have leftover, we basically take the chicken, because I have this on the menu sometimes, it's special, and we shred it up or chop it really finely or even put it into a food processor, which I try and avoid because I think it kind of mangles a little bit. And we put a little bit of that milk combination in there to loosen up and we make things like ravioli or tortellini out of it, which is wonderful. Okay. So I would pop that right in the middle and then we'll start to get some of this around the outside. How are we looking, guys? Give me a vote of confidence up here. I think now would be a good time to give out some free stuff. What do we think? Can I grab some of the guys from out the back? Who wants some macro goodie bags? <laughs> I, thought, I thought I only heard about 12 people just then. I've got 40 bags or something up here. Okay, free stuff coming. Ladies and gents, that's my first two dishes. Quinoa salad, chicken roasted in milk, vegetables. Thank you very much.